Hello everybody and welcome to the Stitch Wraith number 5. This is the Bunny Cool epilogue. I don't need to say anything else apart from if you want to go and see the other off epilo uh, epilogues and how all of this uh, is working on my channel then go and watch the previous episodes. Anyway, um, here we go, Num number 5, ep uh, epilogue number 5. This is exciting. <laughs> I'm so excited to see where this is going to go. Anyway. Let's begin. Larson sat at his desk, ignoring everything else in the office. On, a normal, on any normal day, he'd have trouble uh, concentrating while Roberts sprayed air freshener toward Powell's desk, while Powell bellowed at Roberts for spraying Powell's garlic heavy meatball sandwich, while two drunk bikers hauled in for fighting continued trying to assault each other, and while the rest of the people in the office either talked on the phone or to one another. But today wasn't a normal day. Today, a marching band could have been doing formations between the desks and Larson wouldn't have cared. Today, he was onto something, or at least he thought he was. Bending over the papers and photos in front of him, guarding them with his elbows so he didn't have to explain his ideas to anyone else, Larson first poured over the photos of the Phineas Taggart crime scene. They showed exactly what he remembered seeing when he'd arrived at the factory to crazy scientist laboratory conversion weeks before. Viewing the scene had been like looking at a modern day Frankenstein's lab. The room where the scientist's remains had been found uh, had been packed full of scanning equipment modified in incomprehensible ways and hooked up to the strangest collection of junk he'd ever seen. Much of the junk had been just as mystifying as the equipment modifications, gears and hinges and mannequin parts and antique con contraptions that looked like medieval torture devices. But one collection of junk had been combined in an especially disturbing way. Looking, as, looking at it had twisted Larson's insides and put his blood in a deep freeze. Because he'd been so rattled by what he was looking at, he hadn't looked at it closely. Now, he'd realised, He'd been an idiot. He should have looked harder. If he had, he'd have figured out what have what the stitch wraith was a lot faster. Or would he have? Even if he'd put it together, mightn't it have take him some taken him some time to come to terms with it? Although he was sure now, he wasn't totally sure because he was sure of what was totally insane. If he was truly certain, he'd be telling his colleagues. Instead, he was peering at the evidence as if it was a treasure he, was, he wasn't willing to share. Larson looked at the junk. <laughs> Larson looked at the junk conglomeration. There we go. Big word. That had so horrified him. I'm, pr I'm proud of saying that. And he knew he was looking at the beginnings of the strange figure he was looking for. In the photo he held, the doll's head could be seen only from one for, uh, from the side. That's how Larson had seen it in Phineas's laboratory as well. This is why Larson hadn't immediately recognized recognize the stretched face when he'd seen the picture in the chief's envelope. But that head, he was sure it was the head, was attached to a metal endoskeleton. Okay, so the mysterious figure was always described as wearing a hooded cloak, but Larson remembered seeing a long and volumin voluminous hooded trench coat in Phineas's clothing. That could easily have been misidentified as a cloak. Larson set down the photo and he began reading through the inventory list from Phineas's property. Running his finger down the list, he read the items aloud under his breath. <coughs> Sorry, my voice is going. <laughs> he stopped at the tenth item down. There it was, one robotic dog, disassembled, manufactured by Fazbear Entertainment. Larson looked at the endoskeleton again. It seemed to have an addition. So part of that dog could have been so part of that dog could, could have been used on the endoskeleton. Okay, so we have an animatronic endoskeleton linked to a part that came from a Fazbear Entertainment robotic dog. Was he making too much of a leap connecting the dots? The dog connected to Fazbear Entertainment, which was connected to the Freddy's murders, and the dog connected to the thing with the sketch face. So that meant Larson's current investigation could be connected to the Freddy murders. A paper airplane hit the top of Larson's bent head. He slapped at it and frowned, looking up. 
Earth to Larson, Roberts said. The detective's close-set grey eyes were aimed at the photos Larson was shielding. I asked what you were doing. Thinking. About what? Stupid stuff, probably. No way Larson was going to tell his straight arrow partner. We're of, t of tweet... <coughs> oh my gosh. Why is my voice going? <laughs> I said we're as well. It's wearer. Oh, I'm sorry. Wearer of tweed jackets with leather elbow patches and too proud owner of a perfectly groomed goatee about his fledging theory. Want to grab some lunch? No thanks. Robert stared at Larson for a moment. Larson stared back, his face as blank as he could make it. Okay, Robert said. Larson shot the paper plane back across his desk to Robert's. Nice one, he said, hoping to distract Robert's from any suspicion that Larson was onto something. Roberts was almost as proud of his aerodynamic paper aeroplanes as he was of facial hair. Roberts grinned. Thanks. He got up and strolled away from his desk. Larson waited until Roberts was gone, and then he stood. He needed to get over to the evidence locker. He'd chew on his theory on the way. The old stone building had originally housed the city police department, but this was now the department's annex where the more obscure functions of the police department were carried out and where the, all the records and evidence were kept. In the evidence lockers, musty basement aisles, Larson stood on a stepladder and pulled a stack of three battered boxes from a shelf above his head, setting them on the floor. The all three boxes side by side, Larson squatted in front of them and took off their lids. He coughed when the persistent odour of smoke wafted up from the boxes. Then he peered into each box. Larson's heart rate was in onto something mode, thumping loud and fast in his chest. The fire, so far in the past it was almost ancient history in the department, had never been solved. Larson didn't know a lot about it, but he did know the fire was connected to one of the founders of Fazbear Entertainment. There we go. Ooh. His idea was that if the stitch wraith was connected to Fazbear Entertainment and was seen at the site of the fire, the stitch wraith might have been looking for something that had put into evidence years ago. He didn't think it was that much of a stretch to reach this conclusion, but the first three boxes didn't do much to bolster his theory. He replaced their lids and climbed up the stepladder. He climbed back down, shifted the ladder, climbed back up again, and pulled another stack of boxes from the shelves. This time, he took the lids off one at a time. When he took the lid off the third box, he raised his eyebrows and nodded. Grimm hadn't been back to the railroad yard since he'd seen a mysterious figure prying loose parts from the tracks. Something about that figure had done more than just make his teeth hurt. It had made him want to dig a very deep hole and crawl into it. Since he didn't have a shovel or the strength to dig such a hole, Grimm had decided instead to move his usual hangout place to the far end of town, where abandoned factories rubbed shoulders with several stalwood, stalwood, stalwood <laughs> old neighbourhoods and the west dock of the lake. He found a rusted but sturdy shed just outside of one of the abandoned factories, a factory that had been so recently vacated that a shabby forklift still squatted nearby. The shed although watertight and clean, hadn't been discovered by anyone else like Grimm, so he set up the house under a long wide shelf below a dirty window. Because he knew others could be attracted to such deserted locales, he was happy that he found a shelf in his shed. Wait, he, he was happy that he found the shelf in his shed, made a suitable lounging platform for keeping an eye on his surroundings. Sorry. And it was a good thing he kept an eye out, because on the, his third night in the shed, he spotted the mysterious figure, happy that he was at least in his usual crazy thoughts tonight. He still had trouble continuing to breathe as he watched the figure drag a bag through a double garage door size opening in the boxy metal factory shell. What compelled him to follow the figure to see where it went? Was it that curiosity he felt the last time he'd seen the figure, or was it perhaps some self-destructive urge? Maybe it was that crazy voice in his head. Whatever it was, Grimm found himself scurrying stealth stealthily uh, and perhaps a bit unsteadily toward the opening into which the figure disappeared. When he reached it, he hesitated for a second, questioning the wisdom of his actions, but he went through the opening anyway. 
Preparing to be jumped the second he entered, Grim was surprised and relieved to find himself in an empty triangle, uh, not triangle, triple garage sized space that widened into another space beyond. And he was even more surprised and pleased to hear movement in that second space and see enough light to pick his way over the debris strewn um, concrete floor. The dragging movement he heard was disconcerting and would have sent any normal running any normal person running for his life. Grim, however, hadn't been normal for several years. When Grim reached the front edge of the second space, he paused. He waited, listening until the scrape and shoosh sound of the dragging bag was far enough away to make him feel fairly certain he could follow without running into his quarry. It didn't take long for him to feel like he should make his move. Taking a deep breath for courage, he took another step, and he stopped. He was in a huge square expanse, an expanse with flat walls and high ceilings, an expanse filled with piles of junk. He figured this was the main floor of the old factory. It was at least a couple thousand square feet in size, and its high ceiling peaked at a blank of skylights, which allowed murky daylight to brighten the area. Grim realised he stood on an elevated rim of the floor, a rim about 15 feet wide. It ran around the perimeter of the huge space. Several sets of concrete stairs with metal stair rails led down to a level about six feet lower. On that level, on one side of the cavernous square, a massive dirty blue trash compactor was set part way into the concrete floor. It had a filthy, scarred chute that led from the elevated rim down into its metal bowels. It was quiet and still now, but Grim could imagine it in action, pummeling trash and then tipping it out into a shallow concrete pit near the end of its lethal enclosure. Near the trash compactor chute, a, s a small shelf hung on the wall. The shelf held a pot with two bright red flowers shaped like starfish. Ooh, there we go. <laughs> Grim couldn't imagine anything looking more out of place than those two flowers did next to the powerful eater of trash. Grim blanked, uh, blinked and watched the cloaked figure drag his bag to one of the junk piles. He couldn't see what was in the bag, but he glimpsed a doll's arm hanging from the opening. Dressed in a bright blue dress with equally bright pink ruffles, the arm looked so innocent and sweet. It didn't belong in this room of metal and mechanical junk. Nothing belonged in such a room. Because the junk in this room wasn't just any junk, it was the junk of nightmares, the junk of blood-curdling histories. The junk in this room was a collection of the worst mechanical monstrosities imaginable, spotting the remains he'd seen removed from the tracks. Grimm also saw the carcass of a robotic dog and several partial animatronic characters. It looked like someone had blown up a factory of creepy robotic toys and then piled up their remains. Not even the crazy voices in his head could convince Grimm to stay in this room. He backed out and retreated as quietly and as fast as he could to his rusty shed. Jake, aware that he was being watched but not concerned about it because he could sense the soul and the character of the person watching, emptied the latest bag of infected items on the shortest pile in the abandoned factory. It made him sad to see the doll's arm. Well, all of it made him sad, actually. Toys shouldn't have been things that held horror and anger and fear. They should have been containers for joy and love and laughter. Ever since Andrew had told Jake about all the infected things, Jake had been using the thing uh, he and Andrew were in to gather all the stuff Andrew had infected. When he first had the idea to do that, he wasn't sure how he'd, how he'd actually do it. He didn't know what he and Andrew were in then, just that it was made of metal and it could move. But then he understood he was in an animatronic endoskeleton run by a battery pack, and he understood he was looking at the world through a doll's eyes. None of that felt strange to him. The only thing he thought was funny was that the thing they were in was wearing a hooded trench coat. Going around in a trench coat felt really silly. And it was hard to go over all of this in, the, in this thing too, harder than he'd thought it would be. Andrew had infected so much stuff. Jake hadn't understood how tiring it was going to be to use his will to get the locations from Andrew's mind and make the animatronic go over the place and finding the stuff. Jake was feeling so worn out, like he had before he had left his little boy body. He wasn't sure he could keep doing what he needed to do. Maybe he should just give up and let go. Jake hadn't done anything wrong. Why did he have to be the one to fix Andrew's mess? 
Wasn't he a good boy? Didn't he deserve to have some fun? I think we need peanuts, don't you, Jake? A smiling man asked. A crowd cheered and a different man called out, Hot dogs, get your hot dog here. Maybe a hot dog too, the smiling man asked. Jake froze with the empty bag in his hand. Was that a memory? Did he just have a memory? He cocked his head. Since he'd been in this metal endoskeleton, he hadn't had a sense of smell. But now he felt like he was inhaling the aromas of peanuts and hot dogs. He could also feel something new. His face, or the face of what he was in, suddenly felt warm, like he was outside in bright sunlight instead of where he was, inside in a dingy factory. This had to be a memory, because it for sure wasn't happening right now. It felt like a memory, and the man in his memory had, this, had said his name. No, wait, it wasn't just a man, it was his dad. Jake had just experienced a memory of his dad. What are the flowers for? Andrew asked. Jake ignored him. He was concentrating. The memory, if that's what it was, had felt really good. Jake wanted more of it. He closed his eyes and focused on the smells and the sounds and the sensations. Let's have both, Jake's dad said. He motioned and a man came over with a tray full of roasted peanuts in small bags. Jake felt himself settle into his little boy body. He looked out through the little boy's eyes and he saw a big field of grass and a huge crowd of people. Jake, what about the flowers? Andrew asked. Jake didn't answer. Instead, he picked up a watering can he'd left under the shelf holding the flower pot. He walked over to water the flowers. At the same time, he returned to his memory. As Jake watched his dad exchange money for one of the bags from the tray, understanding came back to him. For the first time since he'd become aware of be being in the animatronic he was in now, he fully knew himself as he truly was. He was Jake, the little boy, and he was relieving, reliving an afternoon at a baseball game with his dad. It felt so real, and Jake began to feel as if he was being sucked out of the thing he was in. He felt like he was a puff of smoke, and he was being borne by an air current away from the being that had contained him. He could feel himself being pulled into the memory itself, and he intuitively understood that if he was enveloped in the memory, he could stay in that happy place forever. The crack of a bat resounded and the crowd rose to its feet, cheering. Get your glove up, Jake, his dad shouted. Jake raised his baseball-gloved hand, and he drifted even further from the animatronic he'd been in. Jake? Where are you going? Jake! Andrew shouted. Jake realised he could easily relax into this wonderful memory and allow the whole of who he was to be extracted from the animatronic that contained him and Andrew. He could stop trying so hard. He could go have fun. Jake? Andrew called out. But Jake couldn't leave Andrew. His new friend had never known love, and if Jake left, Andrew would be lost forever. Jake couldn't let that happen. Jake w looked hard at the piles of trash in the compactor. He forced the memory from his mind. By putting his whole attention on what was here now, he wiped the memory away from his awareness like he was erasing a blackboard. As he did, he settled back into his place in the animatronic. He watered the flowers, and he ignored Andrew's repeated questions. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, th this is... Ooh, okay, this is getting complicated now. This is getting really complicated. What is going on? Okay, that's very weird. That's very weird, especially if you read The Real Jake. That's kind of weird. Anyway, I, I guess <laughs> I guess that's it. Uh, that's, that's everything for now. Um, part 6 is going to be coming out very soon, and then Part 7 won't be coming out for another, I don't know, week or so, because the book isn't actually out yet. But thank you so much for watching. Um, please do like, comment, and subscribe. And I will see you in the next video. Goodbye.